Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. back folks on the gsmc basketball podcast brought to you by the gsmc podcast network as always i am your host nick robin and today as always we have a tremendous show but let's start with talking about what's going on in the world right now with covid things are spiking everywhere and the unlikeness of having a fun fourth of july weekend looks to be slowly creeping outside the door as um, states such as New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut today have now mandated anyone from California flying into one of those three states a 14-day quarantine with a fine of up to $10,000 for anyone that does, that does not cooperate. So looks like I'm going to have to change my summer plans as I was looking to head out to Montauk later in July. But we'll see how things go these next couple of weeks, but just want to remind everyone Keep your mask on. Might seem silly, but you can save millions by just listening to our governor. So today I will be discussing J.R. Smith's potential reunion with LeBron and the Lakers. The Orlando 2020 schedule was released, and I will be going into its impact on the playoff race. And on Nick's picks, I will dive into the most psychotic athletes of all time. So stay tuned for later. But first, I will begin with a look at the decision 10 years later. And for those of you who don't remember, let's go back to 2010. It's July. LeBron James, the best player in the world, arguably could still be the best player in the world, is up for free agency. He's only 25 years old. And I want to stop and reflect on how I felt in this moment. It was right before my birthday. My birthday is actually on July 10th. He made his decision on July 8th. And I just remember the impact it had on the entire NBA landscape and really the impact it had on the entire country almost. So this past Sunday, there was a uh, ESPN had a new show called Backstory where they did some investigative journalism into the background of the decision. And I can't believe it's been 10 years. Like, Jesus Christ, I was I was 16 years old at the time, or about to be 16 years old. Now I'm about to be 27, and it's crazy to think that it's already been 10 years. And I remember that summer that the weather, right after LeBron made his decision, the weather in San Diego, which is known for its sunny skies, was just awful. June gloom throughout the summer, and I felt like it has to do with LeBron uplifting the nature or the balance of the world by deciding to team up with Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade. So let's go into, uh, not to steal ESPN Thunder, the backstory. So this was actually an idea from Bill Simmons from a fan mailbag. Bill Simmons found this intriguing to get the best player in the world on national TV. So he pitched it to LeBron James and his party along with ESPN. President John Skipper was thrilled for the free media coverage that they the exclusive media coverage they were going to get to the best player announcing where he was going to go so just think about it imagine i don't think there's anything comparable to it imagine if tom brady went on national tv or if mike trout or barry bonds went on national tv for an hour show just to announce where he was going to play and the fact that 10 million tuned in to watch lebron decide where he was going to go. And after he made a decision, it jumped up to $13 million. It is absurd. It's the 
it's still the highest rated TV show on ESPN, non-sports event show of the last, last I believe, since 03. So it's just mind-boggling that so many people were so invested in where this 25-year-old was going to play next was going to play for the next several years. So really what this comes down to is a power control. That's what it all is. It's a power control between the leagues, the league and the players. And LeBron wanted wanted to take this power and create his own narrative. So that's where that's where this all leads and we're going to go into that a little bit later in this segment about what he does later on with his media company and the decisions he made after the decision. So let's start, I'm going to start by looking at what the legacy or the domino effect that this caused the league. So we see after this, this is the first player form super team again, LeBron James, Chris Bosh, and D Wade. After this, over the next several years, we see the Lakers in 2012-2013 acquire Dwight Howard, attempt to acquire Chris Paul. Unfortunately, the league vetoed that for someone who is an LA fan and wanted to see Kobe continue his prime for a couple more years. Unfortunately, they got a 39-year-old Steve Nash, and we all know how that ended with Kobe blowing out his knee as he played too many minutes leading up to that year's playoffs in order to get them the eighth seed. And then in 14, we see this again with Love and LeBron James teaming up with Kyrie Irving. And then we hit the climax of the power player empowerment movement when we see Kevin Durant go to the 73 and 9 Golden State Warriors after his team was eliminated leading 3 to 1 in the Western Conference Finals the season before. And then the next year we see PG-13, Carmelo Anthony team up with Russell Westbrook in Oklahoma City and then most recently with DeMarcus Cousins joining the Warriors in what is which in what was Entirely an all-star team with five all-stars from Curry down to Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, Kevin Durant, and DeMarcus Cousins. So we've seen this evolve over the years and how things are done. But let's look back. Let's go back to 2010 and let's see where LeBron, let's go look at LeBron's main suitors. The Chicago Bulls, the New York Knicks, the Miami Heat, and the Cleveland Cavaliers. So Taking a look now at the Chicago Bulls. So they were just coming off a 41 and 41 season. So as mediocre as they can come, 500 winning percentage. The best players on the roster at the time, Derek Rose, Joakim Noah, Carlos Boozer. They attempted to recruit Bosch and Wade. And for a moment, it looked like it might be a reality and that LeBron might come along with them. Unfortunately for Chicago, and honestly for the history of the league, I just don't think it would have been right for LeBron to go to where Michael Jordan won his six championships and learn how to win there. I think it was better that he did end up going to Miami over Chicago. But yeah, Chicago, for those last couple days leading up to the decision, really thought they had a chance at landing, if not three, at least two of the players, whether it's Bosch and Wade, Bosch and James, Wade and James. There was definitely a likelihood. And now, moving on to the New York Knicks, who were coming off a horrendous season, as they've shown many of those over the last eh, 20 odd years since they made the finals in 99. They were coming off a 29 and 53 season, and it looked like LeBron came out, has come out and told people that he was looking to go to New York. Whether that was with Bosch or Wade is still unclear, but as we know, they struck out on LeBron James, signed Amari Stoudemire, Stoudemire, who had a tremendous three months in New York. He was averaging like 25 to 30 a game. And then you see the midseason trade for Carmelo Anthony. Kind of got rid of a lot of their assets when Carmelo could have just signed later on that summer in free agency. But again, Carmelo and his mistakes on his career will save for another show. Now let's go down to Cleveland. They had just come off their... Second consecutive 61 season, but no finals appearances to show. The team did not have much outside of LeBron James. Mo Williams was arguably their second best player. But I think it was just time that LeBron wanted to venture outside of Ohio. As he's mentioned in his letter coming back to Cleveland, he wanted to go to college. And Miami was his chance to go to college, to learn how to win. Like a lot of us as 18-year-olds, we learn, we go to college to learn to make some mistakes, 
to learn a bit more about ourselves and who we are and what we want to do with the rest of our lives, even though, to be honest, a lot of us come out almost as clueless as when we came in. And to top it off with Cleveland, I don't think nobody, particularly Chris Bosch came out and said, did not want to play in Cleveland. So I think for, for the three of them, Bosch, James, and Wade, the best decision was to go to Miami. Wade already had a history there, winning a title in 06. They had one of the greatest coaches slash executives in Pat Riley. So, I mean, it just made a lot of sense. And hey, Miami, no state tax. I think that was a big determining factor as well. And these players, stay, or with Wade staying in Miami and Bosch and James joining him there. And at the time, we all know, LeBron makes his decision. And within 30 minutes, jerseys are burning all over Cleveland, Ohio. The posters are being torn down. The city is almost on the brink of a riot. They are that upset that their homegrown star, the chosen one, has left them. And at the time, I, I, yeah, I was, I disagreed with LeBron's decision. But again, I'm not LeBron. He has the power to do whatever he wants. But I thought he, not that he owed something to Cleveland, but I thought it would be nice. I like the Derek Jeters, the Kobe Bryant's, the Tim Duncan's, the players that are willing to stay with a franchise for their entire career. It really speaks to who they are and in terms of loyalty and what that means to them. So I thought he had the pieces. I mean, he had won back-to-back 60-win campaigns, which, again, is not easy in the NBA. So I think he had he could have done it on his own. I think he needed one more piece. He needed a Chris Bosh. He needed a D-Wade. I don't even think he needed both of them to win titles. But as we know, what happened after this, LeBron goes to Miami. They lose to the 2011 Mavs. And to point out the decision, I think, is outside of the fact that it did raise $2.5 million for the Boys and Girls Club, is one of LeBron's only mistakes of his entire career. And again, he, he did this to save, to support inner city kids and raise a ton of money for a great cause. I would say one little change he could have made is from changing it to an hour to just 30 minutes. Because no one wants to see him meandering around questions for a good 30 minutes and then have to go in. I think they could have made this 30 minutes. They could have cut it in half. I don't think there would have been as much hate towards this if that would have happened. So, I mean, not a big change, but I just think an hour was way too long of a show. And I think 30 minutes, they could have done it very nicely. But again, it was Maverick Carter, LeBron's first time really producing a show. So, I mean, you're really going to learn from your mistakes. But again, moving on, LeBron goes to Miami. They make four consecutive finals, losing to the Mavs, winning back-to-back, and then losing to the Spurs. He learned to become a winner, and that is why he went to Miami, to learn from Wade, to learn from Pat Riley, to win games. And again, he made a mistake, or he went about things the wrong way. I don't think he would have changed anything, because I think you need to learn from some of the mistakes. He went there, he became the villain. The villain did not suit him. And he came back in 2012, 2013, or sorry, 2011, 2012, and he dominated, winning the title in five games against the Thunder, winning the championship again next year. And this allowed him to go back to Cleveland and win a title there. So moving, so what LeBron has tried to do this entire time is control the narrative. And no example is more concrete than the fact that LeBron created his own media empire which actually this week the uninterrupted spring hill entertainment robot co have all consolidated into one overarching company so it'll be interesting to see how that works moving forward but it's great to see lebron someone who has the resources to do what he wants to create his own companies to create his own narrative and control that narrative for that that for so long the league was in charge but now the players have the power and are using that power for the greater good because LeBron has done so much, not only for the basketball world, but for the whole country at large, whether it's opening up a I Promise school, whether it's going at our president who, I'll keep this short, does not respect, from what he's shown, does not respect minorities and people of color. You can say what you want, but the texts are the texts are right there. The writing is on the wall. 
LeBron has been a great advocate for Black Lives Matter and has done so much for this country. It is amazing. I think over the last 15 years, him and Barack Obama are the most influential people in our country, and they've done so much. He might be an athlete, but he's so much more than that. And looking at the narrative that LeBron created for himself, yes, the, the one-hour-long show looked a little narcissistic, a little pretentious, a little, a little egotistical. He corrected that with his open letter in Sports Illustrated and his return to Cleveland with Lee Jenkins, which was very well written, and I think it was beautiful. I like. I think I almost... When I was sitting in my parents' living room the morning of his of the announcement that he was going back to Cleveland, I think I almost started tearing up because he, he wanted he always wanted to go back to Cleveland. It's obvious that he wanted to go. He wanted to become a winner somewhere else. He wanted to learn from the legends from Pat Riley, but he wanted to go back and fulfill a promise to bring a championship to Cleveland, which he did in dramatic fashion as we all know in 2016 he came back 3-1 backs against the wall came back and dominated that series leading in every major statistical category and then going to the lakers in 2018 he has simplified it even further with a 34 word memo announcing his move in free agency to the lakers so really over time he's matured he's learned from his mistakes and lebron has done something no athlete has done before him, but I believe we will see many athletes doing this after him, which is controlling the narrative. And that's what the decision was about. It was about controlling the narrative, being able to make, being able to write his own book in life and not, and he quotes this in his letter to SI is he wants to do this journey uninterrupted, which of course is the name of one of his brands. So very cheeky, I mean, very clever in a way but it's great to see someone like lebron i mean it, there's no there's nothing you can say negatively at this time because i think he's just done so much positively and i mean he's on the verge of potentially winning a four championship that will, that will continue to just build his legacy so that's my take on the decision 10 years later in retrospect things could have been done a little smoothly a little differently but i think in the end he made the best of what at what at the time at the time was a bad situation or was bad PR on his end. So moving forward after this commercial break, I will be discussing the potential reunion of J.R. Smith and LeBron and how not J.R. Smith, but another player might be the key to LeBron getting that fourth elusive championship. So stay tuned after this break. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. So we just got done discussing the decision 10 years later and its impact on the world of not just basketball, but I'd say sports overall and the narrative that LeBron has been able to carry with himself the rest of his career and what he's given to players that are coming after him, Zion Williamson, Sean Morant, Luka Doncic, and all the young players in the league have somebody to look up with to show them that you control the narrative, you are the talent. You're the one that people want to see. 
the one that the person that people are paying the money to go watch. So it's just amazing the impact LeBron has had on the league as a whole. It starts with Larry and Magic bringing the game, bringing the game to popularity in the States, and then passing it to Michael Jordan, who brought the game globally, and then Kobe, who continued that, and then LeBron, who gave power to the players in this league against the owners that sometimes don't have the best interests of these players. So moving on, we're talking about J.R. Smith reuniting with LeBron in L.A., according to Adrian Wojcikowski. Avery Bradley, one of the Lakers guards, has opted out of Orlando, and LeBron and J.R. Smith have a long history together in Cleveland. In his time there, he averaged 10.5 points a game, 2.9 rebounds, 2 assists, about a steal, shot 38% from 3, only a little under, a shade under 70% from the line. So as good as JR was in clutch moments, I would say he's not as effective as a player as some people might perceive. But looking at his career, he won the championship. He was a big contributing factor in the championship in 2016, particularly in that game seven. He came out hot in that second half, scoring eight points, including back-to-back threes that brought Cleveland back into the game. He's a winner of the Sixth Man of the Year Award in 2013, but he has but he's had his fair share of negatives and controversy throughout his time, throwing soup at a coach in Cleveland. And, of course, the boneheaded move in the 2018 finals. To to quickly recap, 2018 Game 1, LeBron plays arguably the greatest finals performance in the history of the league, scores 50 points single-handedly, single-handedly almost beating the greatest team of all time. And, hey, if they win that game, they end up getting swept because, let's, okay, let's go back. George Hill at the line, can put the Cavs up one, misses the free throw. J.R. Smith miraculously gets the rebound. All he has to do is either pass it out to an open shooter or uh, shoot it from, I believe, three, four feet from the basket. Instead, he dribbles around with that <laughs> stupid look on his face, not knowing what's going on. Unfortunately, the Cavs go into overtime. They end up losing. But really, that could have been a huge momentum changer in that series. I mean, honestly, if they win game one on the road, they've taken away home court advantage from the Warriors. They can go back to Cleveland, split it there. And at worst, they're going back to a game five in Golden State, tied at two games apiece. I mean, we'll never know what happens now because they lost the game and that's the last time we've really seen J.R. Smith on a court as the next year he played only 11 games for Cleveland. And after LeBron left, they wanted to bring in a youth movement with Colin Sexton and kind of throw out throw out J.R. Smith, buy him out of his contract, unfortunately, or I guess however you want to look at it, J.R. Smith did not agree. He didn't want that to be his legacy in Cleveland, and I don't blame him because he brought a championship to the city. And we all, J.R. Smith is just a character. I think my favorite moment is him going shirtless for the next week after they won the championship in 16. He's a pleasure to have in a locker room. He's exuberant, but he cares. He's a clutch three-point shooter, a solid defender as well, and he can bring a lot of good to a team. But, I mean, at the age he's at now, he's 34 years of age. He's going on 35 on September 9th during the restart of the season. And again, the last time we saw him in the NBA was in 2018, 2019. So we haven't seen him in a while, and we don't know what he can bring to what he can bring to the game, uh, bring to the floor. So looking at the depth chart right now with J.R. Smith, we have LeBron at the point with Rondo, Caruso, and Quinn Cook, Contavious Caldwell Pope, who shot 39 percent this year. So he's he's been great from behind the arc. J.R. Smith as the backup. Danny Green at the small forward, shooting 38%. Jared Dudley, then Anthony Davis, Kyle Kuzma, Markeith Morris, JaVel McGee, and Dwight Howard. Going back to J.R. Smith, though, and reading an article in The Ringer by Haley O'Shosti, she did point out that LeBron need quote, quote, LeBron needs a two-guard who is best suited for a supporting role, shooting, scoring, and defending, but is still capable of creating when called on, end quote. And I think... That's exactly how this Lakers team has been built with a bunch of, with LeBron and Anthony, top heavy, 
very top heavy on the roster, and then the rest is just filled with adequate role players such as Caruso and Kyle Kuzma and Danny Green, guys that maybe on other teams wouldn't get as much attention, but when you're playing LeBron, Mike or everything is zoomed in and dissected to a T. Everyone's gonna criticize what you do, what you didn't do, and it can be tough as as we've seen, it can be t- very tough for some players such as Jordan Clarkson, Larry Nance Jr., where it didn't really click for them and they saw their effectiveness go up once LeBron left to the Lakers in free agency. So I don't know if J.R. Smith is the X factor that the Lakers are looking for. Again, we haven't seen him in the league in nearly two years, but I think this is a great time for redemption. And I know someone like J.R., don't, again, of course don't know him personally, but I feel like he's really carried this weight from this boneheaded move in the 2018 final. So what better way to redeem yourself than to come team up with LeBron, bring Laker Nation a championship for the first time since 2010. So over a decade, I mean, the last time the Lakers went this long without a championship, it was 88 to 2000. So about a 12 year gap. So we're looking to see, I mean, can J.R. Smith be that guy at 34, going on 35? Can he bring that same spark off the bench, maybe in a more limited role than what he was playing in Cleveland, where he's around 30 minutes a game? Can he come give you a good 15 to 20 minutes, maybe similar to how Dwight Howard has come in this season and taken a backseat to LeBron and provided great rebounding and scoring in a limited role? And maybe he can bring something that of the same so I don't know. J.R. Smith, he can be a lot to handle, but hoping that it's more positive than negative. But in my opinion, the player that most excites me and provides a better punch in helping LeBron get that next championship is Dion Waiters. Only 28 years old, and we can all laugh about him taking edibles on the plane and getting suspended for several games and Looking at his numbers over the last several years, he's only played 120 games. He has posted averages of 14 a game, three and a half assists, so a little bit better of a playmaker than JR, and shooting nearly 37% on over five and a half attempts a game. So someone I think that could, that's younger, he's bigger, can guard, can guard uh, bigger guards at 6'4 rather than JR Smith at 6'3, and also, I mean, players who are, that age, I mean, they just don't move the same as they did in their prime. So I think Dion Waiters is the X factor that can lead this team to the promised land. But look, I think we're really going to see the effect of not having Avery Bradley, who has, again, decided to opt out of Orlando due to everything going on with COVID. I res- we respect his decision, but it, it really hurts the Lakers, who at this point are very weak On the guard position, as I mentioned earlier, we have LeBron James at the point, and his backups are Rondo, Caruso, and Quinn Cook. So not the best depth in the world, not what we're looking for from a team that's looking to make a finals run. But as we've seen with LeBron's last team in Cleveland and his team last year, they've been very thin. They've been very top-heavy when it's come to their roster. I mean, Anthony Davis has been a huge help this year, putting up 26 and nearly 10 a game and really at this point we just want the season to restart like we're itching here we know that the Lakers are hungry as they sit in the number one seed in the west and we're going to get into after or we're going to get into in the next segment the team um, the scheduling and what that means for the playoff race the Lakers are I believe one or two wins away from clinching the number one seed throughout the playoffs the Bucks look to be look to have home field advantage throughout the playoffs today as the best record in the NBA by a wide margin so again we're excited for games to finally be back after this break we will be breaking down the schedule the biggest games leading up to this year's much anticipated playoffs stay tuned for more
check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. So we're back now, and let's take a moment to recap what we just discussed. J.R. Smith look, very likely looking to sign up the Lakers, giving them another player to put in that to add to that backcourt depth, which is very lacking with lack of, let's say, superstarish players. I mean, they got solid contributors and Danny Green, who won a championship last year with the Raptors, but again, lacking in depth and. What they make, what they do lack in quality players, they do make up for in championship experience, as you do have LeBron, Danny Green, J.R. Smith. Haley Davis hasn't really played in any big games. Kentavious Cape, Podwell Pope played in a couple playoff games with the Pistons, but I would say out of most of the teams, they do have most of that championship experience, and you can't take away from LeBron's. Um, eight consecutive, eight consecutive, Jesus Christ, can we take a moment to dissect that? Eight consecutive finals appearances. So let's see how it goes once the restart, but now we're taking a look and take a moment to wrap around the fact that the NBA has been postponed for 110 days. 110 days. Do you know what can be done in 110 days? Well, I have a list here for you. So Elon Musk built the world's largest battery in less than 100 days. Somebody voted across the entire world, took him only 40 days. The world was created, according to the Bible. Chris Humphrey's marriage to Kim Kardashian, lasting only 72 days. And then lastly, in 100 days between March and June of 1815, the former first citizen of France, Napoleon, escaped from his prison on Elba, assembled 600 troops, which he landed at Cannes, faced down, and recruited a reg- regiment by his personality alone, marched to Ma- Paris, recaptured the government, built his army to 280,000 people, invaded Belgium, and with half his army defeated the Prussians, and finally was defeated by Wellington and an allied Angelo Prussian force at Waterloo, was abducted again, and headed off to another island prison. So that'll happen in less than 100 days. So it's crazy to think that we have been on pause for 110 days, and we are just itching for the NBA to come back. And thankfully, this past Friday, the NBA released the schedule. And the most enticing part about it all is the race for the number eight seed slash potential play-in game that we are so excited and hope to see. And of course, the NBA has thrown a bone to the Pelicans once again. Their schedule, according to Strength of Scheduling at NBA.com ranks 22nd out of 22 teams. So definitely the NBA helping Zion reach the play-in game. And looking at their schedule, they start with the Jazz and the Clips and then the Grizz who are in the eighth seed. So that's a way for them to jump a game by beating them. And then they finish off with six sub or five, sorry, six, including the Grizz, sub 500 teams. They play the Kings twice. A game against the Magic and Wizards, the two bottom dwellers in the East, and a Spurs team without LaMarcus Aldridge. Talk about a cakewalk. And before the postponement of the NBA, the Pelicans were one of the hottest teams in the league, and Zion was 
playing incredible. So it will be interesting to see how teams start out out of the break. Unfortunately for Dame Dollar and the Blazers, they face the third hardest schedule. The Celtics, the Rockets, the Nuggets, the Clippers, 76ers, and Mavericks all in a row. So not not too likely to see them take over the eight seed or get to within four games for that number nine seed play-in game. And looking at this, according to the Ringer, the Grizzlies and the Pelicans have a 71% and 14% chance of making the playoffs, with the Pelicans having a 34% chance of gaining that number nine seed for the play-in game. The Grizzlies have an 87% chance of claiming the eight seed. But more than likely, it's going to be the Grizzlies versus either the Pelicans or the Kings if it comes down to the play-in game. So let's take a look with the team that has the most to gain during these seedings. And I have to look at the Dallas Mavericks, who have surprised a lot of people this year. Luka Doncic putting together one of the greatest 20-year age seasons in NBA history, right up there with Magic Johnson, LeBron James. So very exciting to see someone put up such numbers at such a young age. So it's going to be exciting to see what he does moving forward with the rest of his career. But yes, the Dallas Mavericks surprisingly have the highest point differential in the West outside of the two LA teams. And as of now, they can potentially land anywhere between the three and seven seed. For their own sake, they would like to avoid the seven seed because, I mean, no one wants to face a Clippers team with Kawhi, Paul George, along with Lou Will, if he just, who is still 50-50 on returning, Montrez Harrell, and just probably the most stacked team in the entire league has depth at every position can go a lot of ways both big and small so definitely a team you don't want to face in the first round and I know a lot of us would love to see Luka Doncic advance in the playoffs maybe even have a matchup with the Lakers later on so they're looking at somewhere between the three and seven seed the Rockets surprisingly in the sixth seed and just looking at the Rockets before the break they beat the Lakers, going with a lineup of 6-7 and below. P.J. Tucker, I believe, was the tallest player in their lineup. So the fact that they're the sixth seed, it's it's a pretty tight race this year for the West as two and a half games separate the third seed Nuggets and the sixth seed Rockets with the Jazz and Oklahoma City filling in that 4-5 range. And as I mentioned on earlier podcasts, the biggest surprise – this year is Oklahoma City. After they got rid of Russell Westbrook and Paul George, they brought in Chris Paul, who has been a tremendous leader with the three guard monster and Dennis Schroeder, Chris Paul, and Shy Gilgis Alexander. So exciting, exciting for basketball to be back. And the worst case scenario for this Mavericks team that who Kristaps Porzingis, the number two star with the two Euro players, has played at a high level as of late. The worst case scenario for this team could be the Mavs slipping into that, not slipping, sorry, gaining that six seed with the Clippers falling back into that three seed and thus would have to face them again, which is the last thing I would say any team wants in the playoffs. Moving over to the East, the Bucks are already six and a half games ahead of the number two seed Raptors. So I would say we can pencil them in for that number one seed. But sorry, as I mentioned earlier, home court advantage is not it's not a thing. I mean, all games are played in Orlando, which is going to be interesting to see. No fans, of course. So not that it matters where you get seated, because I mean, really, what advantages are teams going to have? And as of now, I don't think the NBA has released anything, but I think there's a lot of funny gimmicks you could play to give teams with the higher seeds certain advantages. I wouldn't say adding points to the board, but hey, why not? I mean, whatever way we spin it, this year is going to have an asterisk. LeBron could win a championship, but hey, they had to take 100, 130 days off, 130 plus days off before the season continued. But let's go back to the Raptors. Number two seed, they have an 87% chance of keeping that. And with everything going on, anything is possible. So what is the likeliness? Could the Raptors, with their veteran-led roster, Kyle Lowry, Pau- or Mark Gasol, a rising star, and Pascal Siakam, 
OJ Ananobe, who has taken over for Kawhi Leonard and has provided some great defense with a streaky three-point shot. Rondé Hollis Jefferson, another 6'6", 6'7", positionless player. Serge Ibaka, Fred Van Vliet, who came out huge last year in the playoffs. Stanley Johnson, a former lottery pick, fourth year out of Arizona. With this team and Norman Powell, another Pac-12 guy out of San Diego, California, actually. Lincoln High School, shout out, UCLA. Can this team put together some improbable run? Could they upset the Bucks again, even without Kawhi Leonard? Can Pascal Siakam reach another level? Can he go another level even further than he, what he already has this year in order to repeat for the Raptors? And wouldn't that be a story that the Raptors, a team that doesn't have the superstar status of the Lakers or the Clippers or the Rockets, or I guess even the Bucks with Giannis, the best player in the world, and Chris Middleton, who's become a great second banana. Can this Raptors team somehow shock the world without, after losing Kawhi Leonard to free agency, can they once again repeat? They played, I don't think anyone expected them to play at the kind of level they have going into, or go, coming into this season. People definitely assumed they were going to take a step back, but then we saw that opening month with Pascal Siakam averaging nearly 25 to 30 a game, playing at an absurd level, keeping up the high-intensity defense, only getting better, similar to Kawhi, who continued to get better year after year. Can the Raptors prevail and make even a run at the Eastern Conference Finals, play the Bucks, and again, there's neutral courts, there's no home court advantage, as we've already discussed. Can they do the impossible? Can they beat the Bucks? Can they take out the Celtics with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and Gordon Hayward and the new leadership under Kemba Walker? It's going to be exciting to see because, again, this is there's unpredictability this year. We don't know how things are going to be. And to be honest, we don't even know if this season is is go if this is even going to happen, they might shut it down midway. Imagine we walk in one day and a player tests positive and there's panic and mayhem, just like there was with Rudy Gobert. So we're, it's really going to be interesting how things play out in Orlando. But it, it's going to make for an exciting time. And again, 110 days have passed and counting since the last time we saw NBA action. So we're tuning up, getting ready. Players are going to be reporting tomorrow. Tomorrow, players will be reporting. So they have to cancel all those 4th of July plans. Players will be reporting tomorrow to Orlando to begin workouts to the season starting on July 30th. And we're done here for now. We're going to go into my personal favorite segment of the show, Nick's Picks. And we're looking at the top psychotic athletes of all time. There's going to be a little bit of recency bias. We'll go into that a little bit, but stay with us. We will be right back after this brief commercial break. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. So we just took a look at the restart schedule for the NBA, the seeding, the teams that we anticipate to meet in the 
in the play-in game. We looked at the Mavericks, who have the best opportunity to leapfrog some teams and hopefully avoid a first-round matchup with the Clippers. And then we, we broke down, or I discussed the Raptors and their potential at repeating without, after losing Kawhi Leonard, after losing Danny Green. So very exciting. Can't wait for that to happen. And now moving on to Nick's picks. And today we're looking at the most psychotic athletes of all time and what really determines the site. What really marks someone as a psychotic athlete or crazy? What are we looking at? I think a lot of the people that we're going to discuss coming up have a big pop culture or cultural impact that goes beyond their sport. And the thing about these psychotic athletes is people who aren't sports fans that are just everyday folk that maybe not might not be the biggest basketball fan or baseball fan or boxing fan know these people by name, know what they look like know about their background and that's what makes them so enticing is that they're more than just a player on the court maybe not for the best reasons but they're recognized they are recognizable to the common person and we're going to start with my honorable mentions beginning with john rocker and for those that don't know john rocker was a closer for the braves during that during their late 90s run of consecutive division titles. They won 14 consecutive, as you may remember. In 95, they won their only World Series. But yes, John Rocker, besides barking at players and fans, and he was a huge bigot, unfortunately. Very racist, something that is unacceptable. And at any point in time, it is unacceptable. But I'm surprised that this wasn't as blown out of proportion when it happened. And I'm going to quote from a Sports Illustrated article that someone from SI asked someone from SI asked him what he would do if he had the opportunity to play for the Mets or the Yankees in New York and quote I'd retire first. It's the most hectic, nerve wracking city. Imagine having to take the seven train to the ballpark, looking like you're riding through Beirut, next to some kid with purple hair, next to some not my words, queer with AIDS right next to some dude who just got out of jail for the fourth time, right next to some 20-year-old mom with four kids. It's depressing, dot, dot, dot. The biggest thing I don't like about New York are the foreigners. You can walk an entire block in Times Square and not hear anybody speaking English. Asians and Koreans and Vietnamese and Indians and Russians and Spanish people and everything up there. How the hell did they get in this country? End quote. Holy shit. That is disgusting. Awful. I don't care where you're from. You do not talk like that. America is the home of the free. That's a great part about this country is you can come in, you can build a new life. John Rocker, don't know where you grew up, but not acceptable, especially never acceptable. So, wow. I think he might, yes, he's definitely psychotic. He's also just a terrible human being for ever saying anything like that. Jesus Christ, we're moving on. I don't even, I'm, I'm speechless here. Like, I have nothing else to say about him. So next on the honorable mentions, Tanya Harding, former figure skater turned boxer, whose ex-husband put a hit on Nancy Kerrigan, who was up for the Winter Olympics in 1994. Recently, there was a biopic made about Tanya Harding called I, Tanya, starring Margot Robbie, who, as always, is incredible. Definitely recommend. Take a watch. Take a seat and watch it. There's plenty of time for all that jazz right now to catch up on movies. And a lot of these players, once we go into this, a lot of these players do already have biopics or some kind of documentary about them. So great opportunity to learn about some psychopath athletes. So Tanya Harding, John Rocker, make my honorable mention. Moving forward to... Nick's picks, most psychotic athletes, starting with number five, the artist formerly known as Ron Artest, Meta World Peace, who has had a very, I I always like a good redemption story, and he really, I think, was sorry for what he did, and I'm referring to the malice at the palace, probably the darkest moment in NBA history. He gets shoved by Rasheed Wallace, and he is sitting on The scorer's table, lying down, which honestly, probably is your mistake right there. A fan throws a drink at him. He gets up, goes into the stands. He goes into the stands. And the worst part is he doesn't even go after the right fan at first. 
He goes after another fan. Imagine you're sitting at a game, having a great time, and all of a sudden, Ron Artest is coming at you full swinging. Scary moment. So yes, probably one of the scariest moments in NBA history. Ron Artest ended up being suspended for the remainder of the season, as well as the playoffs, where the Pacers were eliminated in the second round. So, unfortunately... It was a lost opportunity. For a Ron Artest, it was a lost opportunity. They had a chance at really going far that year. He had a chance He had a chance at possibly being an MVP. The Pacers were the best team in the East, and they lost him along with Steven Jackson for quite a while. And Meta World Peace's uh, tricky pass doesn't just start with the Mouse of the Palace. It, he also admitted to drinking Hennessy at halftime while playing with the Bulls. Not a great start to your career where he was drafted as a rookie. Yes, drank Hennessy at halftime. Not a recipe for success. And then in 2007, Artest was forced to relinquish ownership of his dog, a great dame due to malnutrition and neglect. So, not the, not the best guy in the world. Fortunately for him, he comes to LA. He hits the big shot in Game 7. Wins Kobe another title and... He'll forever be recognized in Laker lore uh, for his amazing contributions to that 2010 team. So, number five, Meta World Peace. Moving on, this guy needs no introduction. Had a cameo in The Hangover. Mike Tyson, tattoos all over his face. He can't walk anywhere with. He can't walk anywhere without being mobbed. And I'm just gonna go. Besides just being, I'm just gonna go with Fighting of the Year. That alone. Fighting off Evander Holyfield's ear, that puts you in a discussion, Psycho 101. I don't think uh, there's any reason why you would ever bite off someone's ear. A surprise, June 30th, it's actually Mike Tyson's birthday. So happy birthday, Mike Tyson. Turns 53 today, and you have made my top five most psychotic athletes, athletes list coming in at number four. Just to point out, I will, I do, yes, to point out that Mike Tyson did have a very tough childhood. He did grow up with a lot of learning disabilities and really wasn't the brightest guy. Yes, not, I don't excuse his upbringing or the actions that he did, but there are sometimes reasons why people act the way they do. But nevertheless, happy birthday, Mike Tyson. We hope you are able to get that comeback as we've been seeing on social media. So best of luck to you and a happy birthday. Moving on to number three on my list of most psychotic athletes. And we're taking a look at OJ Simpson. So people are going to come at me as this guy is a murderer, complete psychopath. How is he only number three on the list? I'm going to give the judicial system, even though... I might have a take on what I think happened with all the evidence, but like, he was never found guilty in court. So we keep him at number three. And I don't think we need to go into details of the of the trial or the murder case, but the fact, the comical fact that he ends up getting arrested for stealing his own memorabilia a decade later, I think speaks for himself in terms of just not the smartest guy, crazy out there and i mean that's what happens when you take too many hits to the head so oj simpson number three we're going once we finish up the list hey if you have a problem with it send me send me a message facebook me text me uh dm me you know get in get in those dms love to hear your opinion moving on number two most recognizable man on the planet dennis rodman got his own 30 for 30 for better or worse Takes a look at his tough upbringing as well, his time with the Pistons, the Bulls, his post career, but the tattoos, the the green hair, the crazy hairstyles. You can't go wrong with Dennis Rodman, not number two on my list, and the fact that he is one of the only Americans in the country who has contact with Kim Jong Un in itself just speaks to to why I placed him. The second most psychotic athlete of all time. It's there's so much we can sit here and talk about Dennis Rodman. I mean, we got enough of it in the, on the last dance, and I think at this point it's just 
And Bill Simmons mentioned this on his podcast that it's just boring at this point. I think we've heard the same story and he says he's the way he is because of this and that, but we don't really get a great explanation ever. And I think the last dance really proved that, that yes, like you are, you're different, but why are you different? Like he says that over and over, never giving a really a good explanation, but we have to say the guy is definitely one of one. We're never gonna we're never gonna see another athlete like Dennis Rodman. And not even speaking from his psychotic moments and his craziness, but the fact that a guy who didn't play competitive basketball and really until age twenty, twenty one, went to a community college, a no name college in East Oklahoma, balled out there, was able to become a second round draft pick for the Pistons, be a an integral part of a back-to-back championship team go on to San Antonio completely goes completely goes nuts that's when we really saw Dennis Rodman for who he wanted to be with the hairstyle with the piercings where he really let himself out of his shell and hey kudos to him like if you want to act that way more power to you it's your life you're living it and it's just um yeah, I think I think we've had we've seen enough of Dennis Rodman and hopefully he can come to peace with himself cuz I don't at the end of that documentary that for better or worse the 30 for 30 there's a the very ending he talks about his life and how he's one of the most recognizable people in the world and how it just it just ends abruptly like he's not he's not it's like he's not happy with who he is to this day and honestly that's really sad. I mean, kind of touches upon what we went into earlier this week on on uh, mental health, and this is a guy who definitely suffered from a lot of negative or negative meg- mental health issues. So, Dennis Rodman, you're number two on my list. Moving on to number one, and again, as I mentioned before the break, here comes the recency bias. Aaron Hernandez has had a absurd. Netflix docu-series made about him and his life right before leading up to his death with the multiple murders on his accord while playing in the NFL. And I don't think anything can get any more off the rails than a guy who is an active athlete, an active player who is murdering people on the sides, shooting people, has in the way that it went about and the fact that and what happened in the story with him coming or being revealed as either bisexual or gay with his friend from high school who happened to be his quarterback. It's just an absurd story that just makes, that goes every which way. And it's really just, let's touch upon that. It's really just sad that some people just, they can't come out and be who they want to be. And that left a lot of anger probably in Aaron Hernandez and might've led to some of this, I mean, I'm not going to say that the fact that he was in the closet led to him murdering people, but it could have been some sort of contributing factor, not saying that it's right what he did, because of course it's not right. The guy, there's no reason why you should ever kill another human being. We should never have that say. I don't believe in the death sentence. So yeah, that's Aaron Hernandez and everything that went on in his life is just, it's it keep it leaves you speechless. The fact that he was killing people, playing on a Super Bowl winning team, playing in the Super Bowl at the highest level, living in this massive house outside Bristol, and it really shows you that sometimes it's better to leave home. And that is something that a lot of athletes over the years I've seen in documentaries they have trouble with. The worst thing that they can do is play for a team in their hometown with people that don't have their best interests in mind for them. It's all about your support system and being surrounded by the right people. And unfortunately for some of these athletes that we talked about today, they didn't have the right support system and it led them to do some pretty disgusting speechless acts. And let's uh, round that back up. So honorable mentions, Tanya Harding, John Rocker, and then my Nick's picks for most psychotic athletes starting at number five, Meta World Peace. Four, Mike Tyson. Three, OJ Simpson. Many people might not agree with that one. Two, Dennis Rodman. And then number one, Aaron Hernandez. And that is Nick's picks for you guys today. Thank you for tuning in. It's been a great show. 
and it's only going to continue to get better. So please leave comments. I appreciate you listening to the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review because, hey, that helps us out. Also, if you can please shoot us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you, and as always, a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program